So again, welcome to the Make It Big webinar series that is also situated within a series of fun design challenges for students that are inspired by a real life design and construction pro uh, project that James Devlin, football star and innovative designer, is engaged in right now as his kind of next venture in life, uh, reimagining what's possible for his career. Before we get started formally, I just wanted to thank a couple of groups that helped us put together our wonderful panel tonight. Uh, so we have uh, some engineers that are part of NSBE, which is the National Society of Black Engineers joining us tonight. I'd also like to thank Wentworth Institute of Technology uh, for one of our wonderful presenters tonight. And also we learned that some of our panelists are also alums of Wentworth Institute of Technology in Boston. So just wanted to thank uh, both Nesby and Wentworth tonight. So this is episode four of the series. Uh, have no fear if this is your first time tuning in. We have all of the webinars, so episodes one through three are recorded. This is being recorded as well. And I'm going to show you later where you can find the recording so you can catch up. Uh, so it could be a fun binge watch for you this weekend. But tonight's episode is called Ask an Engineer, and it'll be an opportunity for you students, particularly those who are engaged in the design challenge, to ask questions to real engineers who are innovating in both the built environment and in other ways. So what we want to make this as much of a two-way conversation with you as possible. Uh, so you will see uh, at the bottom of your screen, there are three icons there. There is a chat icon, uh, and I wanted to make clear to you as students to protect your privacy. We have disabled the chat so that you can't chat with each other. However, when you do chat, you will be chatting with real life people. Uh, so we have our wonderful members of the Autodesk education team here with us tonight to answer your questions. Uh, so Matthew Dalton, who is the community manager for Autodesk education, will be there uh, to chat with you, to answer questions, uh, as well as Donald Bell, who manages marketing communications for Autodesk Education. So they, they'll be bored if you're not chatting with them. So make sure that you chat it up with them, uh, ask them questions, uh, and they are a wonderful resource and wealth of information for you. Last but not least, Jenny Fennell uh, is here also helping uh, with you and engaging throughout uh, the webinar today. Uh, so even, for example, after the first presentation, uh, Jenny is going to be here and she is the content development manager for Autodesk Education and she will be taking questions. Uh, if you have questions for the panelists or for the presenters tonight, please put those in the question and answer because that will make it easier for Jenny to find them uh, so that we can ask your questions to the presenters and the panelists tonight. So again, if you want to chat, chat with uh, Donald and with Matthew. But if you want to ask a question to the panelists, please send those to Jenny in the Q&A. So I should probably introduce myself. My name is Kellyanne Mahoney, and I'm a youth program specialist at Autodesk. Uh, I am on the construction team technically, but I work closely with our friends on the education team as well. Uh, so this is coming up on my fourth year uh, at Autodesk. But prior to joining Autodesk, I was a teacher in the Boston Public Schools for 13 years. Heather, did you want to say hi? Yeah, hi, I'm Heather Leck, and I'm a product manager at Autodesk for the product called Formit, which is a great um, 3D sketching and modeling tool that you guys might use for your uh, for the contest. And I'm also a former architect, so I'm excited to hear from the engineers today because I love to hear from the engineer, my engineer colleagues. So happy to be here. Thank you, Heather. And that's why we love bringing together engineers and architects to really kind of show how um, making a building, for example, is such an interdisciplinary you know, project that uh, is becoming more and more collaborative, uh, particularly as we integrate technology, which is another theme of this series. So next, I also wanted to introduce football star James Devlin, uh, who is our inspiration for this series, as well as for the design challenge with students. James, do you want to say hi? Sure. Hi, everyone. James Devlin. Um, former New England Patriots fullback, um, played in the NFL for 10 years. And before that, I was a, a mechanical engineer by degree from Brown University. So I too have a lot of um, interest in this, in this webinar, but I was lucky enough to, to kind of link up with Autodesk and, and do this series of webinars and try to promote 
um, you know, engineering, architecture, construction, the whole um, STEM, you know, realm to, uh, to the younger generations. And so I'm really looking forward to this next design challenge. You guys helping me try to think a little bit more down the, down the scope of, of engineers and what they would look in, you know, particular problem solving and stuff like that for my overall dream in the next chapter of life, which is uh, designing and, and developing a fully encompassing athletic complex from sports, um, sports uh, performance, I'm sorry, sports performance and sports rehab all kind of in one in one big building. So that's, that's the dream. And I'm really just looking forward to, you know, seeing your, um, you know, your ingenious ideas and uh, some fresh takes on, on a thing I've been thinking about for a long time now. So thanks everyone and, and look forward to it. Thank you so much, Gene, James, and thank you for helping us activate our engineering mindsets tonight in such a really fun uh, real world challenge. Um, so we'll talk about that in a little bit, but before we begin, I just wanna let you know kind of what's gonna happen tonight. So we're gonna start off with a presentation uh, by a student at Wentworth Institute of Technology. Uh, and then we're going to move on to our panel tonight. So these are our wonderful panelists uh, who some of them work in a built environment and some of them work more kind of in the realm of manufacturing. But one of the themes that we want you to take away through this series is the idea of convergence. So the ways that manufacturing and construction are converging in interesting, uh, new and exciting ways. So we'll get into that a little bit later, but I'm so excited for our panel tonight. Uh, so some of our takeaways, so we hope that you take away something <laughs> from this webinar series and from this particular episode. Uh, tonight, we hope that you find out how a college student is combining entrepreneurship and design to make her concept for a gym for people with autism a reality. We also hope for you to meet engineers who will share their personal stories and visions for the future. And we also want this to be an opportunity for you to ask questions. We will have lots of time for questions at the end. Uh, and we even hope that you might ask questions, thinking of James kind of as your client as well, uh, on how you could make your first Make It Real Student Design Challenge a success. But also, we just want you to meet the engineer so you can think about uh, engineering as a potential exciting career, career path for you in the future. So just to give you a sense of where we're going in the series and where we've been. Uh, so this series has been a journey through architecture into engineering where we are right now and ultimately into construction. We hope that you learn a lot about these different disciplines uh, through the series, but we also hope that we uh, engage you in thinking like an entrepreneur, in thinking like an architect, in thinking, uh, you know, like a designer or someone who works in construction or even using an engineering mindset. Um, so I'm really excited tonight because we have a student uh, from Wentworth whose name is Emma, who's gonna talk to you a little bit about how she's kind of engaged all of these different mindsets uh, in order to tell us a story about a project that she actually hopes to, to uh, make real uh, after she graduates from Wentworth Institute of Technology. So Emma, it's all you, you wanna take it away? Sure, thank you so much. All right, let me, um, oh. could you I'm stop gonna stop sharing, sharing my screen yeah. <laughs> so you can share your screen. All right. All right, can you guys see my presentation? Yes, now we can. Switch the display settings. Ooh. Here, All it's right. perfect, Emma. All good, perfect. All right. Um, so thank you, Kellyanne. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Emma Manning, and I'm a senior business management and entrepreneurship major at Wentworth Institute of Technology, which is in Boston. Um, and I'm so excited to have been asked to speak to you guys today and um, hopefully give you some sort of business and design perspective as you finish out your challenges for James. Um, so over the past four months, I have had the awesome opportunity to work for myself, uh, for my co-op, and I was able to kind of kickstart my own uh, venture. So, and my venture is called uh, My Muscle Connection. And my goal here is to reimagine inclusivity in gyms. So first off, I would want everyone to kind of close your eyes and try and picture yourself walking into a gym um, where, you know, picture Planet Fitness, 
and think about what you might be hearing or seeing. And then picture going into that same gym as someone who has autism or a sensory processing disorder and think about how difficult or overstimulating that might be for you. So um, if we look at this picture I just grabbed, uh, you can see there's bright lights, um, you know, the fl fl fluorescent lights. Uh, the TVs are probably on and making a lot of noise. There could be music on, people talking, and those machines could get really loud if someone drops something by accident. So just some background, uh, there's 5.5 million adults in the US who identify as being on the autism spectrum disorder. Um, so there's only five gyms across all of America that are catering to this market. So that's where I see a problem and a solution. And exercise and mental health are directly correlated. Those go hand in hand um, and they need to be accessible in my opinion. So there's not really much opportunity for this community. Uh, and I would like to you know, bring that forward. So my muscle connection would be a socially conscious for-profit model. And my goal is also to, to employ um, individuals with autism um, to work at the gym. So briefly want to touch about my research that I did. So if you don't know, um, autism is a spectrum. There are common sensory aversions. Um, there are some behavioral differences. Um, you know, there's hyper-focusing on certain topics, um, overstimulation, and socialization can be harder for someone who is not neurotypical, um, or they just have different methods of communication. So when I was researching, I really wanted to center my research around the, um, the person's experience, not, you know, some sort of diagnosis. So this uh, TED talk with Ethan Lissy uh, was really insightful. And my takeaway from him was that the world is not built for us. And that stuck with me as I kept, um, you know, pursuing this uh, project. So my goal here is to make something for this community. So exercise in the brain. Uh, when you exercise, you know, you release endorphins that promotes blood flow to the brain cells, all good things. And your mental health is directly impacted by that. You feel happier, you have a better self image, confidence building, um, your concentration and memory can improve. And so exercise and autism. So I found a really interesting uh, study that I wanted to highlight uh, from the uh, Biomed Research Institute that looked at structured physical activity and social interaction and communication. So they took two groups of uh, people who were either um, going to be exercising for a certain extended period of time regularly and a group who was going to just not. And then they looked at how they uh, were able to communicate after that study and they found um, drastic improvements in social skills and motor behavior as well as decreasing stereotypic behavior. And there are also uh, common other disorders with, with um, autism. So OCD, ADHD, anxiety, depression, and SPD. So common um, for people to be on a lot of medications for this. And I found what was really interesting is that there are these running clubs set up and people who are on the spectrum love these um, because they find that there's a sense of grounding, goal setting, they can socialize. Um, when they choose, you know, you're a part of the team, you have to talk when you want to, and then you go off and you're running your race and that's your own thing. Um, and a lot of those people were able to come off of their medications for other, um, you know, anxiety or ADHD. I also spoke with personal trainer, Eric Stone, who's in Illinois, that's his gym right there, 2XL. Um, and he works with people who are on uh, the autism spectrum. And he found that his clients benefited uh, greatly from lifting weights, squatting, bench pressing, they really enjoyed that sensory um, experience. So I'm looking at this and I want to make sure I'm targeting my market and getting the most amount of people into this gym as I can, making the greatest impact. So looking around the Boston area, um, there are all these towns that had the highest population of students who are on the spectrum age 12 to 21. So ideally this gym would be located somewhere in the Brookline area. Um, doesn't need to be Brookline, but in that area. So some of my gym benefits, um, there'd be sensory modifications like soundproofing, um, natural light, um, some pretty easy things that can be done um, and also modifying equipment as possible. So if you look at this machine up in the right-hand corner, this man's performing a lap pull down. If he were to drop the bar where he is, all that weight that's stacked would come crashing down and make a huge disruptive noise. And I wanna try and avoid that in this gym. So you know, we're gonna have buffers in between the, those uh, plates. That way, if someone does drop something by accident, it's not making as much of a noise as it could be. 
Um, there'd be hand grips that I'm gonna talk about in a minute for some sort of tactile assistance. Um, you know, walk-in classes for people to try it out before they commit to a membership, uh, as well as having personal trainers who are certified in autism uh, fitness. And again, creating that employment opportunity and also um, having YouTube videos kind of explaining what a training session would look like or going to the gym would look like to kind of ease that anxiety about coming in and starting new routine. So those hand grips I was just talking about, um, I was working with an industrial design student, uh, Liz, and I told her about what I wanted to make and she did it perfectly. Um, so these beautiful hand grips, um, all the profits be going to these two charities that I've listed. Um, I really think they're great and I wanna be giving back as much as possible. Um, so these would be uh, for, uh, for sale um, and you know, just to give uh, someone some, it's just fun. And it's also a tactile, um, you know, you're not touching the cold rough metal, you get some sort of barrier. And then briefly just gonna touch about like my pricing uh, setup. So membership is one person or two people on a membership. You get that complimentary consultation with a personal trainer and then uh, two free group classes a month for both those people or just that one person. And then training, same gist. Uh, you can go once a week for one hour, twice a week for two hours total, one person or two people once a week or twice a week. Uh, so we'd also have a scholarship program. So another big thing of mine is making sure this is accessible financially to everyone as well. Um, so most of the funds would be going back into the gym uh, and making uh, the scholarship program available. So there'd be 15 um, once a week scholarships for training and then six twice a week scholarships uh, for training as well. And those would get, um, those would expand more as the gym makes more money. Who are members be? So we have two gyms under one roof. So what does that mean? We're combining two gyms that are identical. One is just uh, sensory uh, modified for personal training that folks who need it. And the other side is for people who, you know, don't really care about any sort of overstimulation, overcrowding, that doesn't bug them. Um, so there's kind of that flow in between the two gyms. Um, and then an example of this would be like a mom and her son has autism and he's doing the personal training and she goes off to the other gym and she's gonna do her workout while her uh, son works out. So looking at the gym itself, I worked with Lily Grace York who is an interior design student at Wentworth as well. And we came up with this conceptual space. Um, you can see there's actual machines in here. There's deadlifts, there's squat racks, bench presses, um, you know, what you find in a typical gym, it would just all be modified um, the deeper you look at it. And here we have some renders she created of the lobby. You can see the hand grips are for sale. Um, and then over here, you can see into that turf area, you can see we really emphasize the natural light. Um, you know, we don't want that, those big fluorescent lights. We want it to be more welcoming, more relaxing environment. And these are just some renders that I pulled off the internet when I was looking at what, you know, I want the office space to look like or what the gym could look like below. Um, not necessarily with the lighting, but what the equipment layout looks like. And then also talk more of business side, marketing strategy. So um, main way be, to be marketing this gym would be through schools and hospitals. Um, so Mass General or uh, Boston Public Schools, for example. Also having that social media presence, running Facebook ad campaigns, uh, Facebook groups for members, and then having giveaways on Instagram, um, engaging with people, and as well as that YouTube that could offer um, some more um, you know, learning experiences. So also to look at the bit more business side, I have to look at what other gyms are doing, these other five gyms. So you can see in Illinois, there's more powerlifting, um, actual weightlifting, which is the theme that I'm going towards. You can also see there's adaptive fitness and movement, and that's more of a body weight, um, balance and coordination workout group class setting. And then we have equally fit in Tampa, and that's more of like an office, and they do one-on-one -on -one personal training in there, and there's not a ton of equipment. And then we have in Connecticut, one-on-one um, -on -one personal training only in this facility. So it's also important to look at what the prices of these places are offering. That way I'm keeping it reasonable in line with the industry. Um, and then briefly touching on the financial side of business because that's also really important to look at. Um, how can we stay profitable? So after um, you know the first year co 
costs of, you know, either constructing someplace or renovating, buying all the equipment or renting. Um, the I'd roughly need about $180,000 to get this gym started, and then it would be good to go from there. So these are just the year one, two, and three showing that the gym is profitable and how we have that huge jump uh, into the third year. So now I think we're gonna do a Q&A and I wanna thank Autodesk and I also wanna uh, thank my two professors, uh, Mozilla and Umashi who are I think here tonight. Um, I wanna thank them for their guidance and support. Um, and also feel free to contact me. I draw my email there. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn as well if you want to connect there, but feel free to shoot me any questions on uh, email. Thank that you. Was so awesome, Emma, and it's such a great example for the students that are trying to kind of engage and do uh, what you uh, just did yourself. Uh, so the way that you're thinking like an architect, I know you started as an interior yep. design student and oftentimes, you know, when you're thinking like an architect, you're mitigating all different trade offs like natural light, and noise and cost and variety and views but then you also kind of thought like an engineer and said well you know some things shouldn't be trade-offs like uh, access for people with disabilities is one example yeah. uh, another that we're thinking about is for um for this engineering challenge is environmental sustainability and also making sure that the building is a great building for the community and also lastly just how you showed us your game plan with your financials uh, and when we get into uh, the construction part of this journey we're going to talk a little bit more about that you know factoring in things like materials and equipment like you did in costs and profit and all those things uh, so i'm wondering jenny are there any questions for emma i do have a question uh, which program or programs did you use to render your images um, Lily Grace used Revit for those and SketchUp, I believe. Okay, great. And then we had a couple comments about the, this beautiful architecture design. So I want to pass Thank that you. along. A lot of people are very impressed with your presentation. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> any other questions, Jenny? I'm not seeing any other questions related to Emma's presentation specifically. There were other, other questions were being asked, but Matthew is taking care of those in the, in the chat. <laughs> he tends to do that. <laughs> That's awesome. You have one more comment, one late breaking comment here. Great job, Emma, so comprehensive. I'd love to hear about how you considered the dimensions of the gym. Yeah, so um, when I was looking at this, I didn't have an actual space in mind. Um, that's all going to be up to what's available when I'm trying to get this going. So it was just a rough um, estimate square footage wise. Um, approximately 2,000 square feet, maybe, probably bigger though, um, to make that the two gyms in one. Mm -hmm. we, we have a couple other questions if you have a moment. Um, yeah. What was your inspiration to focus on the problem of autistic people's barriers regarding gyms? Sorry, could you hear that one more time? Yes, what was your inspiration to focus on um, autistic people's barriers regarding gyms? So uh, my inspiration to really make this project was I worked with uh, best buddies all throughout middle school and high school, and I loved every second of it. Um, and as I got into college, I got really into weightlifting and I was like, I would love to combine those two interests into one thing. Um, and the more I looked into it, um, like that one gym in Connecticut, I was looking at the reviews, everyone loved it. And someone said, you know, can you please franchise? Like we live four hours away. My son wants to work out, but he doesn't feel comfortable going into our gym down the street. Um, so I was like, there's clearly a need here and that people either don't realize that they uh, want or they know that they want and they just don't have it. Mm -hmm. We had someone asking about whether you want to open more than one in other places. Uh, so that's definitely um, into the future and a possibility that I haven't, you know, uh, cleared out of the way, um, but that is definitely something that I would consider, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, another one was, I, I wanna know if this gym is specifically for people with um, ASD or is it intended to be fully inclusive for people with all types of disabilities? It's supposed to be fully inclusive. Um, I've chosen to focus on autism, um, but it, it's definitely not you know, gonna exclude anyone um, from any other uh, needs, yeah. Awesome, thank you. And Emma, also just the uh, your empathy, is really important for design thinking as well, which is something that we also want uh, students to uh, to think about as they're creating their designs. So I just wanna thank you again, cause you're such a wonderful inspiration for students and such a great role model. So, and also thank you for sharing your email as well. <laughs> so we're, we're, thank you. So we're gonna move on to the next part of our program, but do keep the questions coming. Uh, and Emma will be back later too, when we do our questions with the panel. 
So next up, we're going to begin our uh, Ask an Engineer panel. One of the things, so I'm going to introduce the engineers now, but I also want you to think about uh, even throughout this panel, I'm going to be asking the engineers questions first, but we also want to give you an opportunity to ask questions to the engineers, and you can do that as you've been doing in the question and answer, and Jenny can queue them up for them later. So uh, I'm so excited uh, to introduce this panel of engineers, beginning with uh, Brandon Kramer, who is a senior research engineer at Autodesk, uh, where he works on the Autodesk research team. Uh, he's a research engineer on the manufacturing industry futures team under Autodesk research. In his current role, he engages with industry clients by leading and assisting research projects that explore the future applications of generative design and additive manufacturing to optimize components and assemblies. Next, we have Grady Granville, who is a staff civil engineer at Howard Stein Hudson, where he provides design solutions for various city, municipal, and state highway engineering projects. He grew up on the island of Tobago, which inspired him to become an engineer because of the various challenges faced around the preservation of the natural environment and biodiversity and the overall maintenance of a safe habitat for wild and marine life. Next up is Odane White, who is a senior project manager for Jones Lang LaSalle, uh, where he works in corporate solutions uh, and is currently working on the National Grid account where his responsibilities include scope management, budget management, schedule management, and risk management. He is an active member of the National Society of Black Engineers, the Boston Professionals Chapter, and JL JLL's Black Professional Network. And lastly, we have Carolyn Nguyen, who is a manufacturing engineer at Blue Origin, where she spends her time building rocket engines to space. As a first-generation American to Vietnamese parents, she grew up taking care of her four younger siblings and helping her parents at home. This strengthened her nature to solve human-centered prob problems, which compelled her to study me mechanical engineering at Boston University. All right, so again, just a reminder before we switch into the panel mode, uh, please type your questions for the engineers in the Q&A. You might also have questions for James as well, or you might have questions for the engineers about James. So if James were your client, what questions would you have? So please keep those going in the question and answer and we'll have time afterwards for that. So I'm just gonna shift into gallery view so we can see all of our panelists. Uh, and we're gonna start off uh, with just introductions. Uh, so I would love it if the panelists uh, could just go around and tell us, uh, you know, what were your interests as a kid? And how did you find your way into engineering? And also you come from all different disciplines within engineering. So please also talk a little bit about what your job is. Uh, Brandon, do you wanna begin? No problem. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, so Natalia, thanks for the intro. Nice, nice to see everyone here. Um, how I fell into engineering, you know, I kind of just followed my my, my skill set, honestly, um, I didn't really know what an engineer was as a kid. I liked sports, I liked video games, I liked some technology, but I didn't like building technology. I just kind of liked using it. Um, but I was always really good with like shapes and understanding how, how things can like be designed. So I used to love Legos. Um, and I also, I grew up playing volleyball in high school. So I liked really being in like a team setting. So naturally it kind of my pathway just led towards engineering. You know, you work on engineering projects with groups um, and I was relatively good at math. So I just kind of said, you know, why not? Let's give mechanical engineering a try. Uh, it seems to lead to other things. So, you know, let's start with a broad, broad area to study and then see where I focus in on later. Really cool. Thank you, Brandon. Carolyn, you want to go next? Sure. Um, honestly, I didn't know what engineering was growing up either. Uh, I think the earliest toy that I had, I didn't have Legos either. So my mom got me a Barbie doll and instead of playing with it, I started to disassemble it because I was like, how are the arms attached to the body? And I ended up popping it out and I saw that it was like a ball socket, which is pretty interesting. Um, and I didn't know I wanted to be an engineer until I met my chemistry teacher in high school. And he said that he used to be an engineer in the army. Um, I 
actually entered college as a neurobiology major because I thought the brain was really interesting. And I realized I didn't want to do pre-med. So I like solving problems um, at home. We would have storage problems all the time. So I would go to Home Depot, get some elbows and some brackets and start building on the walls. So I found myself drawn to mechanical engineering because it's very practical and you can see it in everyday life. So, yeah. Engineers make it work. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, Odane, you want to say hi and introduce yourself? Sure, uh, Odane White, uh, Senior Project Manager with Jones Lang with Cell. Um, as a kid, uh, to be honest, I wanted to be a pilot, a commercial pilot. Um, growing up, I always loved watching planes, always loved traveling, uh, just like Grady. I am from the islands. I am born and raised in Jamaica. I uh, moved here uh, senior year of high school. And I think uh, at that point is, was when I first got introduced to engineering, where I was really good at drawing and I wanted to go to school. I switched, forgot about being a pilot and switched, went to architecture, uh, where that's actually what I started at Wentworth then, and later uh, moved into design and facilities uh, management. And then later found my way into project management when I learned how as a project manager, you know, I like to be, I'm a very bossy person. And I think uh, being a project manager, you get to control, not I shouldn't say control, but you get to manage people, right? So um, I figured, you know, that was probably, you know, where my skills are best, best set. So, um, and of course at Wentworth, I was introduced to the National Society of Black Engineers, which really helped push uh, me into the engineering field. Very cool. Mentorship is so important too. Um, I hope we get to that later. Uh, lastly, Grady, you want to say hi and introduce yourself? Yep. Hi, everyone. My name is Grady Granville. Um, so I got into engineering because uh, as a kid, I was always interested in cars and, you know, just going fast <laughs> and doing crazy stuff. Um, you know, so after a couple of years in high school, I took courses in technical drawing and, you know, that kind of introduced me to you know, showing different perspectives of, you know, parts, mechanical parts and parts of engines and things like that. Um, as you can see, I have posters of racetracks in my background, um, you know, and then from there, I, I decided to move to Boston from Tobago and I got into civil engineering and now I'm in the highway field. So I design roadways. Very cool. Um, and you can, so you can design small things when you're an engineer and also big things. Um, so really excited to also have a civil engineer here tonight. Uh, so the next question is just kind of getting down to it. Like, what does your day look like as an engineer? Um, even just kind of a typical day, if you could walk us through it. Who wants to take this question? I could take this one. So, I mean, things have been really different since the pandemic uh, happened. But, you know, some of the core things that I do each day, uh, the biggest thing is coordination. So, you know, I work on a team every day. Um, you know, my roadway design team, of course, so we do peer reviews, um, we do check-ins every once in a while to understand the requirements and deliverables of projects. Um, there's also sort of a cross-functional team happening, so with other engineers. So I work, although I'm on the roadway design team, I work with um, lots of landscape architects, surveyors, um, you know, marketing, construction, etc. So there's, you know, that level of coordination as well, so that everyone is on the same page all the time. Um, it's never good to be on different pages when you're working on a million dollar project. Um, the next thing is that takes up a lot of my time is design. So as a designer, I'm always working in AutoCAD, which is industry standard for um, designing highways. Uh, you know, sometimes there's, there's a little bit of a Revit here and there. Uh, there might be like Stad Pro, which is a stru more structural um, related program. Uh, and then from there, obviously, you have to figure out how much your project is going to cost. So I do lots of estimating. Um, and then I would say spec writing as well. So special provisions, which kind of go hand in hand with estimates, is, is kind of like a way of telling the contractor, you know, what is included in the cost of an item or, you know, a piece of the project or some element, uh, which is very important because, you know, there might be cases where things are incidental to another. And what, what I mean by that is, 
you know, let's say you're designing a, a sidewalk, for example, uh, it might may or may not include the excavation, it might include the aggregates, it might include uh, the fill and the cut and all that stuff. So, so thinking um, at that kind of systems level seems to be super important to engineers. I feel like I learn something every time I talk to an engineer. <laughs> Odin, Odin, did you have a response to this question too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I think, uh, first of all, I'll say, I think we're all engineers. Um, as engineers, we're always problem solving. So from the day we wake up, you know, from the time we wake up to the end of the day, I think we're always, always problem solving. Uh, what a day uh, in my life looks like. Um, it's, uh, it's sad to say, but it's, I'm filled with meetings all day. Um, and a lot of these meetings are similar to what Grady mentioned is the coordination. You know, as a project manager, I have, I work with the architects, the engineers, the general contractor, and sometimes uh, specialty um, uh, vendors and bringing them all together, um, you know, for the client, you know, building a, a from beginning to end, uh, from the scope to execution, uh, how do we progress through the project life cycle, right? So for me, you know, the client gives me, uh, scope um, a product what, what they'd like to see done and it's my job to you know work with the architect to de design that to the engineers to the gcs and get that executed right um, so um, building a lot of schedules also doing a lot of um, estimating cost budget building as well you know uh, so that's typically what the day in my life looks like uh, for the most part um, but i think uh, most I think one real important um, part of, of being a PM is um, managing people, you know, understanding uh, there's so many different personalities that, you know, for example, Grady might be, you know, one way and Caroline another and just bringing, you know, being that liaison to bring them both together so that, you know, let, letting them understand that we're, we're working for the same goal, um, so. Engineers are kind of like the glue that holds the project together, both literally yeah. and figuratively. Yeah. <laughs> it was an English teacher once. <laughs> Thank you, Odin. Uh, so the next question is, and I think that uh, both Odin and Grady got into this a little bit. Um, so maybe we'll hear from the other panelists. Uh, what are some skills you use today that one wouldn't expect would be important to an engineer? Uh, Carolyn, did you want to take this question? Sure. Um, someone mentioned it earlier about skills. I think empathy is definitely a really big skill, like putting yourself into someone else's shoes and asking what problems are they facing and what is their goal and how can I help them? That is essentially, you know, being the engineer and it's really hard to get the problem statement right. So I think empathizing with your client or your user or your teammates is super important. Um, another skill that is very important is asking questions. Um, I think as a kid, you always ask your mom and dad why, and that might be annoying to your parents, but if you go up to any professional or an engineer and you ask them why, they would love to explain, or sometimes you might catch someone and they don't know the answer either. So now you're thinking like, oh shoot, now we have to figure it out together. Um, so I would say, you know, those are kind of the, the big two skills and communicating. Um, so don't be afraid to ask questions uh, because it's it's better to ask questions than to not ask at all. Love that. And also like when we think of engineering, we think it's like you're problem solving, but I love how you brought out the point that problem finding. So actually like figuring out what the problem is, uh, is also really essential to being an engineer. Brandon, did you have a response to this question? I did and Carolyn kind of took a piece of mine. Um, <laughs> But I was thinking on, along the lines of like having a growth mindset. I, I didn't realize that that was like a thing until someone mentioned it to me the other day, like literally this year. Um, when you're an engineer, you, you tend to like, you know, you work with customers, you work with other teams. And as Carolyn mentioned, you know, kids always want to know why something's working. Why, like, wh why does it go this way? Why does it do this? And that helps you understand how other things operate that you come across that you hadn't really experienced before. So when you start working with a new customer that's got a new problem, you can start to approach the, the solution in you know, more ways than you are used to. So you don't want to ever try and you know, just repeat the same process that got you 
80% efficiency. You know, the team worked good, but it wasn't great. You would like to work great the next time. So having a better understanding, learning from previous tasks and mistakes um, is often what I feel like is, you know, starting to become part of the day job. Um, but then in general, just honestly teamwork, you know, being able to work collaboratively with uh, your, your manager, uh, maybe your subordinates if, you're, uh, if you are a manager, um, and then your teammates directly because oftentimes you're gonna have to rely on them to, to handle something that you need help with that you don't have the expertise on. And, you know, being able to communicate properly with them, understand when, when they need help uh, is, is really beneficial, especially in the engineering community because Sometimes engineers just like numbers. They don't really want to work with other people. They just want to sit in their hole and stay technical. So being able to work well with, with those folks um, is also really good. I love that you brought up the point too. Like when I think of engineers, I think of someone who's this like real like perfectionist, but also just even in engineering in a field that is so precise that failure is also part of the process as well. You get to learn from it, but um, that it's you know part of the learning process too. Uh, the next question I have uh, is, so, so this is more kind of a philosophical question. Uh, so we talked about design, we talked about engineering, sometimes we use the words interchangeably. Uh, what do you think is the difference between design and engineering? And I guess a follow up to that question is, is there a difference? Uh, so who would like to take this question? I'll, I'll, I'll go first, that's a great event. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, so I think there is a difference um, uh, between design and engineering, I, although I will say that I think they go hand in hand. Um, uh, I think the, you know, design consists of specifications and requirements, while I feel like engineering has taken those specifications and uh, requirements and further describing them for maybe a subject matter expert, right? Um, for example, uh, you know, the architect, you know, the, they design a, a building uh, per code or specific requirements. And, you know, they hand it off to the engineer to say, okay, we need to cool the space. This is, you know, what do we need? They're the ones, the subject matter experts um, that take that design and further develop them. You know? So I think they 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 are different uh, personally, but they go hand in hand. Brady, do you agree or disagree with Odin? <laughs> yeah, I I strongly agree. Uh, that's exactly what it is. There there is the difference, and you know, like you said, um, you know, as you get into in the engineering part of it, um, it gets down into the very fine details of, you know, how uh, your product or project is performing, essentially. You know. It, it's not just a surface level design and um, you know design can also be seen as um, you know one part of a project or a phase you know once you, you start from your initiation where someone comes up with a great idea and then it goes into planning you figure out how much it costs you know what your requirements are your scope your uh, fees and etc schedule how long it's going to take and then you know from there you go into design and that's where you're really putting things down on paper so you know um, you know, it might also play a, a, a small role in research and development, depending on the context of, uh, you know, what type of engineering you're doing as well. So both are a process, right? <laughs> um, so I, I would like actually to, I would like to hear what Brandon and Carolyn have to say about this question. We want to keep it moving. <laughs> so um, my next question is discuss a time when a project didn't go as planned. I know that engineer, engineers really strive for projects to go as planned. Um, how did you adapt to the situation? Brandon, do you wanna take this question? Yeah, um, you know, this, I, I feel like this can happen, you know, quite often if you're, you're stuck looking at a problem for too long, you kind of just don't even know how to look at it anymore. Um, so I, I often try and make sure that I, I just, I turn the computer off for a second, you know, um, having those informal conversations with teams to break away from a problem is, is really key. You know, there, there was a time when we were working on, on a, a customer project for an automotive client and we just didn't know how to approach solving the problem, which already is not good. Um, and luckily we were in kind of like a exploration phase. So we we're still exploring different ways to, to look at the problem but we didn't really have a, a guiding light for us yet. 
So we tried to just learn from some previous projects that we had worked on. We had some conversations with other folks in different teams, um, talked to some other subject matter experts about it and just got away from the specific problem we were looking at. So that was one way that we um, you know, got away from being stuck in a hole. It's just kind of taking a break from that specific problem that you're looking at, go do something else, get some fresh air, talk to some folks who can help give a different perspective on it. And then that usually helps you know, unlock that hidden door. So hard when you're so immersed in a project to step back and feel, you know, object objectivity towards yeah, it. But you care exactly. so much about it. That's great advice. Uh, Carolyn, did you uh, want to respond to this question? Yeah, I have a pretty big boo boo in my very first. Uh, I was part of a rotational program. You know, newly minted engineer working with weld engineers of 30 years of experience and machinists with like 20 years of experience. And I was the youngest person. Um, and we were on a really critical project. Like we had to deliver in eight weeks, a new product uh, to a customer. And essentially the engines were AOG aircraft on ground. So they need this product to come out and fly again. Um, and I was supposed to coordinate with a subject matter expert in welding from another supplier. And we had kept changing the dates and, you know, like the, the weld engineers and the machinists had to work overtime on the weekend to really make this new fixture, this new tool. And Monday came out and I didn't hear back from the subject matter expert. And he said, oh, I'm, I'm actually out in Louisiana. I didn't know we never confirmed on the date. And so everyone was really mad that I did not confirm with him. And I was just so sad that I let everyone down. I was like, oh my gosh, well, what can I do here, right? We, we've already prepared all the tools. Where can we actually pivot and what other work can we do? Because what we actually did was we kind of over-prepared, but there's still a million other problems that we can tackle in the meantime. And then I... I knew I upset my teammates, so I went ahead and got them cookies and donuts, and I apologized to all of them. And so they they liked me again, and yeah. And then so I made sure I confirmed again the next time around, um, and everything went smoothly. We delivered in eight weeks. Uh, so that's how you uh, always always get food. People love food. So, <laughs> donuts yeah. always solve problems. <laughs> And also that the adaptability. So your kind of your can do attitude that like, you know, well, this, you know, this got messed up, but what can we do next? And how can we, um, you know, how right. can we adapt and do something else and pivot, I think is really, you know, important to think about, you know, everybody makes mistakes. Um, my next question is, so imagine, imagine I'm a high school student or a middle school student, or, or think of the high school or middle school students that are here tonight participating. Um, imagine that they want to be an engineer when they grow up, uh, what should they be doing right now if they want to be an engineer in the future? Um, Odin, did you have a response to this question? Yes, um, I would say to start researching schools now. Uh, look at, you know, schools within your area, uh, also outside of your area, you know, the cost for those schools, just educating yourself on, on, on what's out there. Um, and apply. <laughs> I, I don't know. I know when I was in high school, there there was a period in time where you could apply for free, or the school helped pay pay for application. I'm sure there's so much more resources out there right now. Um, just getting out there and you know applying for everything, not even if you're not that interested in a specific school, because you'd never know. Um, also, uh, talk to. Um, connect with, network with current college students at these schools. I know just even on this panel, you, you hear the word Wentworth or the school Wentworth. Um, you know, there's so many of us and, and I'm sure um, we're more than happy to just talk about our college experience and what the school has to offer. There's just so many resources out there. So I, I say, try to research now try to apply, just get your foot in the door, go visit. I know, I know we're going through a pandemic, but if you can go visit a school, um, try to, I think, find uh, something that you're interested in. Know that when you, if once you do start school, your interest might change, um, but that's okay. You know, um, I, I, 
I, I know we've heard of from a few of the panelists, uh, we might have started or wanted to do something at the beginning, but eventually ended somewhere else. And that's just life. But um, I'd say read through your research, get out there and network. That's great advice, Odane. Thank you. Carolyn, do you have some advice? Yeah, um, I think growing up, I was really confused. So if I were to do it all over again, um, find inspiration. Like when you're when you're super young, you know, you can go on YouTube. YouTube is your free resource and you can look up some really great science channels like Vsauce, um, Smarter Every Day. I think the, the YouTuber on Smarter Every Day used to be an engineer himself. So um, I and like there's a lot of cool uh, videos on there. You can watch like How It's Made. That was my favorite show growing up, which is why I'm in manufacturing right now. Um, and then like there's super cool kits out there like look up Mickey Mickey like ask you know try to save up money and find one of those and program something uh there's scratch programming there's like computer clubhouse out there um and also like try to find mentors your mentors can be friends um ask if you have an older brother and sister like hey do you know someone who's a you know in computer science or a mechanical engineer um, and then there's a lot of resources nowadays online too. Like you can go to adplist.org to find mentors, um, create a LinkedIn and don't be afraid to reach out. Like I said, like it's, if you don't reach out, you're not going to get an answer. If you do reach out and you don't get an answer, you're pretty much in the same place, but you might have a chance of getting a response back. Um, so do it early and find out what problems do you want to solve out there? Like what movies motivate you? Like, did you like Iron Man growing up? Um, or did you like Batman growing up? Why are they different? Uh, and, you know, today's Iron Man is Elon Musk or who knows, maybe it's Jeff Bezos, but figure out who really inspires you or maybe even people who work for NASA. Um, I think there's a lot of movies around space nowadays. So find your inspiration and then find the people who can make it happen. So that's Some my advice, advice, Carolyn. And also just bringing up the fact that uh, Odin had mentioned, you know, sometimes it's hard to visit physical spaces right now in these times, but there's so oh, many yeah. online resources, which is great advice. Uh, Grady, do you have some advice? I do. So just to build off of um, finding inspiration and finding mentors first. Um, you know, I think there are lots of resources in high school, such as Nesby Junior Chapters, if you're in the U.S., um, there might be other resources with like SWE, which is the Society of Women Engineers, uh, might be SHIP, which is the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, and you know a bunch of other groups out there that can help you to transition from a high school environment into the collegiate world and then eventually professional. Um, you know, and they have all these different toolboxes that can help you to, you know, really find that inspiration that you need and make a decision on what type of engineering fits your, you know, your life best. Uh, you know, the other thing that I would say is quite important is, you know, just creating awareness of, you know, how you learn and how you approach problems, because we solve a lot of problems each day as engineers. And, um, you know, if you go with it at, with a more process oriented mindset, it's I think it, it, it holds a lot more weight than actually trying to, you know, be a, a person who approaches problems by memorizing uh, things or just having to simply rely on technical knowledge. So you know, if you approach it with, you know, that type of mindset, I think that that's what really differentiates, um, you know, the engineers who succeed a lot. Such uh, good advice yeah. too, to know yourself as a learner, to, um, to be able to actually solve problems and know the best way to approach a problem. Thank you, Greedy. Um, so the last question is for everyone. <laughs> so I wanted you to think about, and so it's not often that you get to talk to so many engineers at once. Um, so my question is, what is a global challenge that inspires you as an engineer and why? So it doesn't necessarily have to be about buildings or about space, if that's the discipline that you work in, uh, but just like what is a problem that excites you and inspires you and maybe activates your engineering mindset? Brandon, you want to go first? I feel like this is the hardest question to, to answer. Um, I mean, yeah, there's a there's a lot of challenges out in the world that you know we need 
old engineers to solve, current engineers to solve, and future engineers to solve. Um, for me, I feel like, you know, water conservation or just like access to water, clean, fresh drinking water is, is, is pretty huge because we don't really, at least, I, I don't think most people understand how much water is used in making anything. Like it, it's literally used in almost any manufacturing process to, to convert um, raw materials into manufacturable materials and then those manufacturable materials into a water bottle or a, 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 a toothpaste um, tube or anything that you find in the store. And just understanding ways that we can try to, you know, go to more water efficient methods of manufacturing and making certain things is something that I, I try and be more, be more aware of. Um, so water conservation, fresh drinking water for the manufacturing space and as well as, you know, everyone around the world who is having trouble finding fresh drinking water as well. So that's, that's for me. I, I think it's a really huge problem and I really don't even know how to, how to go about solving it. So you something can do that's it. on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dane? Uh, for me, yeah, this, this is a hard one too. Um, I would say for me, healthcare, I think, um, and making it accessible for, for everyone, at, you know, at, at a reasonable cost. I, I think, uh, you know, we're fortunate to live in the U.S. where we have access to healthcare, whether, you know, um, it, I, I think here you, you might be treated and then be billed later, you know, <laughs> uh, other countries don't have that luxury, you know, especially, um, you know, talking from experience, my, my home in Jamaica, you know, there, if you really don't have the resources, you don't have the money, you don't get seen and that could cost you your life. So, you know, that's something that's been on my mind for years and um, how, I, I still haven't figured out how I can give back yet or I can, you know, engineer something <laughs> or get to that point, but, you know, it's on the to-do list working on it. Thinking about <laughs> it is the first step. <laughs> yeah. Grady? So for me, um, I think coastal degradation is one of my biggest um, concerns, um, just because I grew up on an island where, you know, we've always had challenges with, you know, the coastline eroding and, you know, trying to preserve the coral reefs and all that stuff. Um, you know, even when I came to Boston and I did my first no, it's not my first internship. It was my current job. Uh, I was working on a, on a project where, you know, the coastline is, the sea level is coming up so high that the water is backing up, you know, a couple of miles back into, um, you know, around Melnia Cass Boulevard, if you're familiar with that area. And, you know, it's, it's really kind of crazy to see that, you know, the water is actually getting that far back. So, you know, we, we've been trying to like engineer a couple of things and put in systems in place to try to mitigate those, those uh, impacts. So I think, you know, this is something that's happening not only on the islands, but it's, it's all over the world. It's so cool that you're able to take your passion from when you were younger. Um, I mean, it's unfortunate that it needs to be applied to Boston, but we thank you for being here and trying to do that for us. Uh, Carolyn, uh, did you want to go last? Yeah, even though um, my background is mechanical and very hardware focused, uh, I think going forward, I really want to invest in the younger generation, um, especially for undeserved youth or anyone who lacked resources growing up. And um, I just, I really admire the, the, ne the new generation Gen Z, which is literally after I was born. So I'm not cool like the Gen Z, but <laughs> they're just so entrepreneurial and resourceful, very empathetic people. Like I think Emma is, you know, a great example of that. And I really do believe that if, you know, if we can create technologies or at least create education that is more creative and helps uh, empower students to find out their skills and, you know, become bolder thinkers with growth mindsets, like, um, you know, Brandon mentioned, how, how many more problem solvers can we have in, in, the, in our world? Like, and they might have new ideas that we don't know yet. Um, and so how do we make, we go to school every day, right? Like from five to 18 years old. So if most of our life is dedicated to learning, then how can we make that 
an experience to help us become more self-aware of what we can do. So um, I don't know how we're going to do that yet, but there's a lot of technology out there. You know, for one, I shared ADP list. And so now everyone's going to know how to network. Um, but there's a lot of different, uh, you know, you can use YouTube now or you can use LinkedIn now to reach out to the next cool engineer. So I just think technology and combining that for learning would be really cool. Well, you're inspiring us now, Carolyn, and you all <laughs> have inspired me tonight. So I just want to thank the panel. We're going to move next to talk a little bit about the contest very quickly, just so that you know about it. And then after that, uh, Jenny, Jenny is going to ask some of the questions that you asked, and we're going to also hear from James. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen quickly again. So you may continue to ask questions for the engineers in the Q&A because we're going to go back to them in a moment and also to Heather and to Jeans uh, and Emma is there. But just really quickly about the contest. Uh, so this series is also uh, connected to a series of uh, design challenges. Uh, so it's called Make It Big. Uh, you can find out more information about the contest. So we're in uh, number two, but it's OK if you didn't uh, do design challenge one, you can jump in at any time. Uh, so that is found on autodesk.com slash autodesk make it real. Uh, and it's on Instructables, which is part of the Autodesk family. I also just want to show you quickly, there is a student who's already entered and I thought it was a great example. Uh, and this student used Tinkercad. So uh, the challenge is to, you know, to think about helping James make his vision work not just you know to be his vision but also to work uh, for the environment for the surrounding community where he hopes to build his gym and also for people with disabilities and you can see how imaginative the student was uh, in thinking about how they could show imagery and also words and they did this in the form of an instructable if you go to the contest page you can learn more about instructables too it's actually on instructables uh, just because we haven't said it yet, this is Autodesk. So Autodesk, we make software for people who make things. So if you've ever driven in a high performance car before, marveled at a skyscraper or, you know, puzzled over the, um, the engineering prowess of, of infrastructure like a, a gym or a gym, yeah, a bridge, uh, or if you've ever had fun playing a video game or watching a blockbuster film, chances are you've engaged with something one of our customers have actually designed. So I just wanted to make clear to you in watching this series uh, and particularly past episodes when we demonstrate, you know, technologies like Tinkercad and uh, Fusion 360 and Formit and AutoCAD we had in the last episode, that all of these, uh, about a hundred of these tools that are professional tools are free to you as a student and as an educator. And you can go to this page to find out more information about that. So the challenge really quickly, I'm not going to read through the whole challenge, but I just want to let you know that the second challenge is to use an engineering mindset in computational thinking to help genes make his vision work for the environment, the surrounding community, and for people with disabilities. So as you saw in that example, it should be both words and images, and you know, specifically talking about how you've addressed issues of access inclusion and environmental sustainability. It's okay if you if you have participated in the first challenge, you can revise that entry for this challenge, or if you're starting new, that's fine too. You can jump in at any time, uh, and we hope you do. Uh, you need to use Autodesk software in order to uh, make your vision uh, into reality or come to life. Uh, so you could use Tinkercad, Fusion 360, Format, AutoCAD, Revit. Uh, again, you can look at that page to find out more information about that. The judging criteria that we'll be using to assess your designs, technical skill, engineering mindset, computational thinking, and also the way that you present your ideas. Um, so you can read more about this on the contest page. It's broken down into very clear criteria for success. We are really excited and we know that a lot of you even here tonight are uh, located internationally, so meaning outside of the United States where we are. Um, so please know that this contest is for students aged 13 to 19 uh, years old. And uh, you can go on the Instructables contest page to find out specific rules about country eligibility, but for the most part, this contest is international. So there are prizes, so you could win a $500 gift card if you're a grand prize winner. Uh, CDW is actually helping us with this contest and they'll help the winners get their prizes. Uh, so you could choose the gift card or you could choose, you know, a 3D printer 
or an iPad bundle, or uh, the, there's a VR headset as well. So check out the contest page for more information about that. Uh, the schedule for this webinar, we're on episode four, but you can go back and watch the recordings. Uh, in April, we're gonna launch a new challenge that is more focused on construction. Uh, in May, we're gonna have a similar panel uh, with construction industry professionals. So please uh, keep checking that autodesk.com slash autodesk make it real page for updates on this program. And also you can find recordings of these webinars on the Autodesk Education YouTube channel. So you can see we already have uh, the first three episodes. Also our film with James is on that channel. And this one should be up there probably, if not tomorrow, by Monday. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to let you know that if you are interested in mentorship and you're located in the United States, it would be great if you, um, reached out to the ACE Mentor Program to see if where you're located has a, a nearby affiliate. Uh, nearby affiliate. Uh, so here is contact information for the ACE Mentor Program that helps students who are interested in architecture, construction, and engineering by connecting you with mentors in that industry and also engaging you in fun projects too. Uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and hopefully Jenny has some questions lined up for the panel. I do. I do. I have several questions. So let me see where to start here. Um, this one was for O'Dane specifically, but all panelists in general. When you're guiding a team, what motivational strategies do you find work best for you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> motivational strategies. Uh, how I like to uh, manage my team is I, I like to get to know them on a personal level. Um, I would say kind of meet with them one-on-one -on -one before we actually get together as a group. Um, I, I, I tend to be very funny, although I know it doesn't seem like that right now, but I, I always come up every time I start a meeting, maybe with like a joke so we can get everyone more comfortable, uh, more interactive uh, and so forth. So, um, yeah. Um, okay, we have another question here. Um, how do you break the bottleneck and stay creative to deliver your ideas and solutions under pressure? And if I can get a volunteer to address that one. Okay, Carolyn. Uh, parallel path. So what I mean by that is you have plan A, always have a plan B. And I think I've used the word pivot before, but if you're waiting on something, just think of like, what else can you do? Do you need more tools? Do you need more support? Can you get working on something else in the meantime? Um, just so just always think of like a new plan and share it. Like don't just keep it to yourself because you need the help to actually make it happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. Is programming important in engineering? Who would like to answer that one? I, I, I can take that one. Okay. Um, I think programming is becoming more and more important in engineering. As, as software enables engineers to do more, um, the, the flexibility and automation behind that, that software is also becoming more available. So if you are an electrical engineer or a civil engineer, you're using some software that allows you to create just one little automated feature to help make your day a little bit easier. If you know how to code that, with Python, C++, Java, whatever it is, you can start to make your day much more, you know, much more easier to handle because you're now automating some of these monotonous manual processes that you really didn't need to. It could be as simple as something as adding the date and time to a form or document anytime you have to write off a, you know, a certificate on something. Or mm -hmm. it could be something built into Fusion 360 that lets you automatically put bolts and, and fasteners and hinges on a design once you're ready to you know, finalize it and send it through to a manager to approve. So there's a lot of um, coding experience that can be gained and, and I guess make your life a lot easier um, that ties into being a traditional engineer and being enabled by a lot of the new software that's coming out. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we have another question. I'd be interested in knowing how much and what level of math is involved in your everyday jobs. Who would like to answer that? I see Grady smiling. <laughs> you know, it, it, it depends. Um, you know, when I'm like, from my perspective, you know, if I'm working on 
you know, something pretty complex like a, a pedestrian bridge or something. It, there is a lot of math there with the structural analysis, um, you know, but if I'm working in AutoCAD, for example, you know, there's, there's less because the software does it all for you. So the amount of math that you would do in, you know, high school or even in college, you know, it, it significantly drops as you get into the workforce. But I would say it, it depends on the industry because I'm not sure exactly what it's like for others. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wait, I have a question for Grady. Sure. Would, would that be calculus if you're doing structural analysis or is it algebra? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> It's I, I guess it's a bit of both because okay. um, the structural analysis does get into a lot of calculus as well. Um, but you know, with that, I would say you know even if you're a high school student and you're not exposed to calculus or ad math or pure math or you know pre-calculus or any of that stuff, you know don't let it discourage you from being an engineer as well. Because I never had those opportunities. So thank you. Okay, we have a couple more. Um, how do you make sure that people like would like and approve your work? And do you always like the work that by you, your own work? You'd like to take that one. <laughs> Any takers? I, I could take that one. Um, okay, some, thank you. Some, sometimes I don't like my work only because like, sometimes deadlines come up and you just have to say, you know what, I, I've, I've done my best. It's not what I wanted to achieve. Um, and sometimes you do get a chance to like make, make additional revisions if the project allows it. Other times you just have to make that work. Um, and, and to Carolyn's point, having that plan A, plan B, if plan A doesn't always work out, you, you have to you know, plan for that plan B and say, you know, let's take a more conventional method here. We wanted to go for the more advanced, cool conceptual approach, but you know, for this design, for this opportunity, it's just really not gonna work out for us. So pushing that along and making sure that the stakeholders involved, whether it's the customer or the team, they're all aware of these decisions. And if you reach a point when you know, plan A doesn't have to work out, everyone is, is still on board and they can say, okay, let's just sign up on plan B you know, we've got some learnings and let's move on to the next project. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And, um, and, oh, go ahead. Yeah, you know, I just wanted to say too that, you know, um, we have to also remember that uh, being an engineer, you're working as part of a team. And uh, so it's not always what you might like, but it's what's probably best for the team. Uh, so just, just that tid tidbit. Mm -hmm. This next question follows well with that. How do you deal with a team with such different people? Everyone is a complex being, but sometimes it's just stressful to deal with some people. How do you adapt to, to working with different and complicated people? I'll, I'll take I'll, okay, I'll okay. that one, sure. You know, um, I, I mentioned this earlier too. I, I like to really get to know the people uh, on a personal level. I think it's very important because um, sometimes you never really know what that person is going through, you know, and just understanding that, you know, they're human too. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that, and that's what, you know, our personalities, we're all different, you know, whether we like to believe it or not, but really get into know that person uh, and sometimes asking questions. Sometimes you ask questions to, uh, you ask questions you already know the answer to, um, just to, let that person be more comfortable explaining and talking about what they do because people do like talking about what they do. You know, it actually drops, helps to drop their guard. So um, that's, the, you know, that works for me. Might not work for everyone else, but, you know, um, as I said, uh, just understanding and getting, getting on that personal level of people actually really helps. And our last question is specifically for James. Should I hold this or do we, uh, I know that James, you were going to talk for a bit. Um, I can ask a question now or, or hold it until. You can go for it. Okay, great. So how prevalent would you consider the therapeutic elements of the gym to be? Will members receive one-on-one -on -one support? Also, would you be using the space for community education events or meetings that might require space for informal gatherings? Okay, uh, yeah, I would definitely be using the space for, for uh, you know, educational kind of gatherings and um, almost like, 
um, almost like this webinar here, but it, you know, an actual physical capacity, and uh, you know, having some uh, some you know meetings and and those kind of things. I mentioned it in our, I believe it was our first webinar um, that I saw a a similar idea from a former NFL player that uh, opened up a facility kind of like I'm envisioning down in uh, Florida, Brandon Marshall, it's his gym's called the home of athlete. And he, he kind of, he had this like stadium seating that he holds, you know, lectures and stuff like that. And he has like prominent people in, in training and sports come and, you know, hold lectures and stuff. And, but they also use it as like stadium seats to do like workouts on. Um, so like that kind of modular way of thinking, um, you know, is definitely, so I definitely would like to have some, something like that, uh, the capacity to do that kind of thing. And then, um, how prevalent would, would the, you know, therapeutic, um, side be, I mean, I think it's, it'd probably be 50, 50, you know, um, thankfully the, the therapeutic uses that the foot space that that needs in a facility is probably a lot smaller than, you know, a having like the the weight equipment and the turf space to do to do movement training and stuff like that. Um, but I, I would like to have pretty much all the um, the modalities that that, you know, that one would be used to in a sports um, a sports medicine facility and PT and stuff, all, you know, all the, just provide literally everything that I could think of um, to, to the athlete. James, did you have any questions for the engineers that are here about your project or did you have any, you know, feedback or anything to share with the, the engineers from tonight? Sure, yeah, well, first and foremost, um, you know, I thought it was just absolutely impressive and just so cool to see you guys speak. And, and I've always been, um, you know, I, when I first got into college, I wanted to be an architect. And that's what I was really passionate about. I thought I was, you know, a really good um, artist and all this stuff. And um, but one thing led to another. I became an engineer because Brown didn't really have architecture. And uh, and then I just became fascinated with just the way the engineering way of thinking. And I could hear it from from all you guys tonight, you know, and it's not even the the problem solving type of type of thought towards the project it's like literally everything like everything through all facets of life um you know how you can kind of just make things better and so i was really just impressed at you know all your backstories and and the way you know that you use your engineering type mind now professionally and um so my hats off to you guys you know it made me um it definitely dusted off some of the last 11 years banging my head against uh, other grown men. But I did have one question specifically for Odane. This is actually more of a personal type question, less about engineering, more about like managerial um, duties. Because as an entrepreneur right now, I'm finding one of my biggest problems is, is delegating. Like I have a hard time doing it. I, I and I think that it kind of stems from the last 10 years, um, you know, playing football, always kind of being the one getting coached and then the one going out and doing the work. And I kind of always just, I have a, I see a problem come up and I just want to do it myself because especially with this project, this is like what's, you know, passionate, what I'm passionate about. Um, so I want to make sure it's done like to my liking. So how do you go about kind of finding the, the the best way to, to find someone that you can trust doing something that you would normally do and then also um you know finding it in yourself i guess to like you know let the let the reins go a little bit and let someone else take take your lead and take your vision and put it into like fruition no that's a good question uh, am i muted no you're good oh, okay yeah no that's a good question you know um I, I and I definitely hear you it's hard to I'm just like you you know we I see I, there I see a problem I just want to do it myself get it done over with um, but then you know it, it creates a ripple effect when you do that right because you have all these tasks that this you, you lose time here and it just creates that ripple effect so you know for myself 
I manage 28 projects uh, that have capital projects and, and they vary, you know, from 50,000 to maybe $5 million a year. Um, and if you don't find that, 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 that point of like, okay, you are the manager, but this person is the subject matter expert, let them, you're paying them or let them do what they do best, trust in building that relationship. So, you know, relationship building is, is yeah. very big, you know, because, you know, trust, I, I look at, you know, what I do as, you know, something similar as a, a, a relationship, you know, uh, between a man and a woman, husband and wife, I'm married. And um, where I'm going with this is you, you have to learn to trust that person that, you know, they know what you want, you describe what you want, you're going to trust them. And yes, you can hold the reins, you give them a timeline, right? Yeah. You want this done by X, but you never want to give them that real you know, if you want it done by Friday, you say you want it done by Wednesday yeah. and you see if they deliver and you trust them, you know, you're trusting them now to deliver, get that to you by Wednesday. And if they do it, it's, it's only going to build more trust and you're going to find yourself, you know, release in the reins and delegating more to these people. Um, so it's, it's, it's by trial and error, I would say, you yeah. know, um, but it takes time. It does take time. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. That's, we can always talk offline, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's, that's, I mean, that's good advice. You know, I got to also know that I'm not Superman and I can't, yeah. you know, that is true. A nearby trade, but there's plenty of things I, I know that I don't even know, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, thank you for that, man. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. This was awesome. And the, oh, Carolyn. <laughs> Sorry. I just wanted to add on top of that. Um, I think, I, I can definitely understand where Odane and, Jan and James are coming from. Uh, what I tend to think is like, you, when you try to tackle it on your own, like you have a solution to do it. Um, but like Odane said, you're, you're like spending much more time on this and not enough time on other things. Um, so you're kind of stuck. But when you push it onto someone else, you find out that it can actually be done a lot faster or that like they've had a like you know a maybe more creative way to do it so you'll be pleasantly surprised once you let that person take the reins and you're like oh wow that's already figured out versus like if I had to do it I would have to struggle with it learn it again and like it would take five times longer than if someone else could do it so that kind of helps um once you start doing that yeah very good point because how many times does do things come up and you're like oh man I didn't even think of that you know so yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. This is awesome. I also wanted to let you know, James, that someone in the chat said to thank you for raising awareness about brain health. So I oh. just wanted you to see that. Sometimes you get Philly shout outs as well. So, <laughs> but yeah. I, so I, it is getting late for, um, I know some of you are like tuning in from like different time zones and it's like super late for you. Um, so I just want to say for those of you, most of you have stuck around this whole time um and you know showed perseverance even though I didn't feel like as long as, as it actually was uh it was because our panelists were so fascinating um and also just want to thank Emma again for um for starting up the night and filling us with so much inspiration um and we just are so excited to see uh what you do in the future as well um so uh thank you so much uh it's getting, I know James has his little ones at home too. <laughs> so, so we've got to wrap up for tonight. Um, but thank you again. And do please uh, check the autodesk.com slash autodesk make it real uh, contest page for information about the contest. It's due April 1st. So get on it students. Uh, and also so that you can find out about the schedule for May and uh, June, no, April and May. <laughs> We're in March now. <laughs> All right, so take care everyone. Have a good night. Uh, and thank you again. Thank you.